Mike Pompeo is uh, echoing, I, you know, everybody's getting in on this act, right? Pompeo, the former right-wing senator from, or co congressman, excuse me, a member of the House of Representatives uh, from California is now, I believe, or maybe it was Kansas, wherever he's from, in any case. Uh, then uh, Trump, you know, put him in as Secretary of State. And now he's claiming that uh, it's dangerous to teach that America's founding was racist. This uh, it, verbatim, quote, if we teach that the founding of the United States of America was somehow flawed, that it was corrupt, it was racist, that's really dangerous. It strikes at the very foundations of our country. Right. People on social media are, are making fun of him uh, for saying this. But, but, you know, I think it raises an important question. And frankly, an important issue. Which is... How does a country improve? How do we solve the vestiges of not just institutional racism, it's almost too soft a word and it kind of describes today, but just the raw brutality of the genocide of the Native Americans and and an attempted genocide, and the, and, and the enslavement of millions of human beings over hundreds of, uh, over hundreds of years, you know, rape, torture, lynching, uh, generation after generation of people, you know, living in terror, families torn apart. How do we deal with the, the aftermath of that? Here we are. You know, it's like a hurricane went through, you know, and, 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 and debris is everywhere. What do you do? Do you just pretend like it's not there? Do you just sit around and go, oh, yeah, sitting here on the front porch, sure looks nice to me out there. Or do you go out and you start picking up the dirt? Do you start cleaning up the, the, the situation? And this is, you know, by and large what both Democrats and academics have been saying is we need to clean this up. And Republicans are now saying, no, we don't want to clean it up. And why would they not want to clean it up? Well, because it was always about white supremacy. It was always about keeping power in America in the hands of white people exclusively. And whiteness has been redefined over and over and over again, although Virginia was really the first back in the early 1700s and the late 1600s to, to in, essentially invent this thing called whiteness. And, and put it into law in ways that other states would emulate, up, you know, so that by the 1760s, it was a well-established thing as a way of, of getting even poor whites to side with wealthy whites over people who are not white. And if we don't, if we don't recognize this, if we don't come to terms with it, we're going to continue to suffer from it. It hurts us all. It hurts our country when some of us don't have access to the same resources and opportunities and, and, and frankly, just quality of life that the rest of us have. There has to be this, this clean baseline for life in America. And uh, you know, regardless of who you are, where you came from. And this was our founding ideal, but we, we are certainly still a long way from there, and Republicans want to keep us a long way from there. And, they, and, they're, and they're going to do everything they can possible to keep us from, from doing anything, you know, moving forward. I mean, here you've got H.R. Uh, 1, the For the People Act, and the John Lewis Voting Act, H.R. 4, that would uh, not entirely, but largely undo the damage that the Roberts Supreme Court has done to the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and make it easier for people to vote, and make it harder to, to, uh, to use the mechanisms of government to rig elections to the benefit of the Republican Party, or any, any party. Frankly, I mean, uh, Democrats are giving up their ability, for example, to gerrymander blue states 
in exchange for ending the ability of Republicans to gerrymander red states. Which, you know, is a pretty reasonable thing, I think. The problem is Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema right now. Joan McCarter over at Daily Kos had a fascinating piece yesterday about how, uh, it, it, you'll recall yesterday I shared with you how Kirsten Sinema is just tanking in the polls. Mark Kelly, uh, her Democratic colleague, the, you know, there's two senators from Arizona, Sinema and Kelly. And Mark Kelly has an approval rating like in the 70s among Democrats. Kirsten Sinema, uh, it's not even hitting 50%. It's like 47%. And it's because she's been working against Democratic interests. And she's, and she's openly, you know, she, see, see, apparently she saw this whole John McCain maverick thing. And what she failed to understand was that John McCain was a maverick in a party that was committed to corrupting and degrading America. John McCain disagreed with some of the militaristic policies. He disagreed with, well, you know, he, he was the one who refused to end Obamacare, for example, because he thought his party was wrong on this. So he was a little mavericky, but he was mavericky in ways that generally benefited the people. Kirsten Sinema, on the other hand, decided that she would show her mavericky stripes by doing the thumbs down on raising the minimum wage. Really? So apparently her PR flax uh, have gotten wind of the fact that she's melting in the public opinion polls in Arizona. And so they got uh, the Associated Press, uh, Lisa Mascaro and uh, Nicholas Riccardi, uh, two reporters over at the Associated Press to write a puff piece about her. And it's out now. You can read it. You know, it's all over the Internet. Uh, they say uh, she is modeling her approach on the renegade style of Arizona Senator John McCain, who died in 2018 and was known for his willingness to reach across the aisle. Well, that wasn't his mavericky part of it. It was his willingness to defy his own party when they were demonstrably wrong. They go on to, and then they quote her, right? Yeah, this noble statement, uh, Kirsten Cinema. It's the easiest thing in the world for politicians to declare bipartisanship dead and line up on the respective sides of a partisan battle. What's harder is getting out of our comfort zone, finding com common ground with unlikely allies, and forming coalitions that can achieve durable, lasting results. Right. That's what you're doing? Really? When did that work? Seriously? The entire story only quotes one Democrat, but it, it quotes all kinds of Republicans. Uh, former re Republican legislative colleague Steve Yarborough giving her high praise. Given how smart and driven she is, it doesn't surprise me at all she's doing so well. Um, a Republican colleague represented Patrick McHenry, McHenry of North Carolina. People may doubt her sincerity, but the truth is she makes an active decision that she's going to work well with people, and I haven't seen her slip up. Senator John Thune of South Dakota, who, you know, Kirsten is always honest and straightforward, two often underrated qualities that are the mark of a successful legislator. You would think that her PR person would be smart enough that, you know, when you're spoon-feeding a story to the Associated Press, you don't want it to be all Republicans who are quoted in the story about how wonderful a Democratic senator is. We'll see how this plays out. Somebody called yesterday and said, you know, she's not trying for re-election. She's up for re-election in 2024. That that's not her goal right now. That her goal is to get, you know, a $5 million a year job as a, as a lobbyist working for Grover Norquist, something like that. I don't know, maybe. Or maybe she just thinks people's memories are short.